Okay, great. Um, so thank you to everyone who's here. So my family is here. My four-year-old daughter is here. My husband, uh, Dr. Charles Back, who was my predecessor, my physician at the University of South Carolina, friends, colleagues. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, a couple of caveats. So this is about, this talk is about the kind of poetic and artistic uses of celestial imagery in the Renaissance. This is not about the nitty gritty science, coronal rays idea, of that, just, to, just to warn you. And the eclipse is only one part. So we'll talk more about um, the celestial world, that part of the, uh, of the title. And secondly, um, I feel like I have to apologize. This is not a TED talk, you know. I, I feel like the whole, you know, the, the world of public lectures is so influenced by that phenomenon of the TED talk. <laughs> And I'm just not cool enough. Um, they always, you know, they always start with like a big image of the globe with a question mark. And, um, so there, there's your TED Talk fix. Maybe, maybe it counts now. I'm not really sure. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, I, I recently returned from Nova Scotia, Canada, which is where my husband was born. This is a picture of the South Shore. Uh, off the south shore of Nova Scotia. And where my in-laws live out in the country, the stargazing is just spectacular. Um, it's so clear with so little pollution, so little ambient light, that uh, as your eyes adjust, you can see a seemingly infinite number of stars. You can make out lots of shooting stars. Uh, you can even see the contours of the Milky Way. It's all very, very still and profound. And it might be a little bit like the skies that one could see in 15th or 16th century Europe, which is the time and place that we'll be talking about today. Even though Europe was very urban by this time with uh, large cities connected by well-established roads, there were still huge swaths of Europe that were basically untouched and probably looked much the same as they did in the Neolithic. Um, there were undoubtedly large pockets of dark sky, as the astronomers might call it, which today in our world are fairly sparse and have to be protected. So we know that Renaissance men and women observed the heavens closely uh, and that their thinking underwent huge changes in this period of the 15th and 16th centuries. So we're going to look at uh, how this thinking about celestial bodies and events was made visual, what's in the visual record, and how art could show not just an understanding, but also the limits of our understanding. So the first thing that I should mention is that our knowledge of our world, the terrestrial world or the earth, is uh, very, in many ways determined by our knowledge of the heavens of the celestial realm. It's easier and more possible to observe the night sky from a fixed point on Earth than it is to circumnavigate the globe and learn about the Earth that way, if you see what I mean. So that is why there were celestial globes, like we're seeing this one here. This is in the Columbia Museum of Arts collection. I'll show you a couple of details of some of the constellations there, this very beautiful object. Um, uh, centuries before there were actual terrestrial globes, uh, globes of the Earth, like we would, uh, like we would uh, know today. So the first terrestrial globe was actually only manufactured in 1492 by the German Martin Beheim, uh, whereas there were celestial globes and armillary spheres in antiquity, you know, 1500 years before that. And starting in the 16th century, when terrestrial globes became more popular, libraries of uh, sort of rich and well-educated people often would have a pair. So you would have one celestial globe and one terrestrial globe. And so I'm showing you this famous painting of Hans Holbein's uh, Ambassadors, you might know. And up here we have the celestial globe and down there we have the terrestrial globe. So they're using the same, uh, the same format, the sphere, to think about the concavity of the heavens and the convexity 
of the earth. So when you're looking down at the celestial globe, you're taking a kind of God's eye view. Um, and this, this works on a couple of levels in this painting. Um, this certainly a celestial globe and a terrestrial globe would be in the collection of someone like the person portrayed here on the left, Jean de Dinville. Um, de, 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 sorry. But uh, it also does a lot of symbolic work because these other um, objects on the sideboard here are representing kind of celestial, divine things and then earthly concerns. You can see that music is represented on the bottom there. And Albrecht Dürer's famous celestial map brings that idea of the celestial globe into two dimensions and into a portable and reproducible format. And interestingly, what I like, and let's see if I can use my pointer here. So he gives credit to these other astronomers uh, in the corners here. So um, Aratus Kellix, Ptolemy, uh, Manilius, uh, Martin Manilius, and then um, uh, Al Sufi. And he has a turban. You can see here, this is an Arabic astronomer. And of course, in the center is Durer's own beautiful celestial creation. So, in a way, he's kind of placing himself in this very distinguished timeline. So this is all to establish that educated people in the Renaissance would know about astronomy. Astronomy was part of the university curriculum, um, and it's something that, uh, that you were expected to kind of know about. And since we're talking about, since we've mentioned Ptolemy here, I wanted to mention that one of Ptolemy's central contributions had been uh, the idea of a geocentric universe. So that's a universe with the Earth at the center. And uh, that's what we're seeing here represented in this painting of God creating the universe. So this was a very persistent idea, especially in art, even after Copernicus in the 16th century uh, formalized the idea of a heliocentric universe, a universe with the sun at the center. So here we have uh, the Earth. Then we have representations of the elements, earth, air, wind, fire. Uh, we have the planets that were known, including the sun. So the sun was considered a planet. And then around the very outer ring, those are the 12 signs of the zodiac. So you can see that kind of uh, mixture of uh, empirical and, um, and religious understanding there. So one of the reasons uh, I'm laying all this out is that it's important to understand how astronomical and celestial knowledge actually function in the day and not to kind of put our own modern prejudices to, to project them onto the past. Um, it's surprising how often this happens. And uh, I find it particularly true of practices like astrology. So you're probably familiar with what astrology is. Um, you know, it's the idea that the movement and relative placement of celestial bodies has some sort of influence on earthly events. So there's one narrative about the Renaissance that goes like this, that after experiencing a dark ages, Renaissance scholars and artists kind of turned away from superstitious practices like astrology uh, and embraced science and this, uh, the systematic study of the natural world. And uh, so some people would point to uh, authors like Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who wrote a treatise against astrology in the 16th century. Um, it was published after his death, um, saying that this undid any kind of primitive belief in astrology. Um, Mirandola, uh, Pico della Mirandola argues that um, astrology, it goes against the Christian idea of free will. If we are determined by the stars, then the, we have no free will. So how can these two things coexist? Um, however, most Renaissance Europeans still held on to some kind of belief in astrology that celestial bodies influenced their own world. Um, re uh, records show that Renaissance princes, so people at the, the highest echelons of society, continued to employ professional astrologers. Um, 
And this is long after Pico della Mirandola, long after this has been kind of part of the argument about astrology. And it's interesting to see what they would require. So a Renaissance prince would usually ask his astrologer for two things. He would want a natal chart, which is a chart that shows the configuration of stars and heavenly bodies when you were born. So uh, you know, maybe if you were born under a lucky star or an unlucky star, and then every year they would ask for what's called an annual prognostication. And if you're wondering, if you're wondering why I'm showing something that my brother doodled in his notebook when he was 12, uh, this is actually from circa 1500. This is a woodcut uh, from several centuries ago, but this is a graphic depiction of an annual prognostication, not for uh, a Renaissance prince, for someone uh, of a lower echelon, but I just, I couldn't, I, I couldn't bear not to show it to you. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll break down a little bit of what's happening here. So uh, one reason I chose it is that it's showing that this year there will be both a partial and a total solar eclipse. So that's what we're seeing, these kind of blacked out eyes of the sun here. Uh, they're saying that war and strife it, uh, there is a star that is um, indicating that, and it will be with probably the Turks, the uh, Turks uh, near this German town. There's a hailstorm raining down on wheat here, so agriculture is going to be a problem. This is a very negative kind of annual prognostication, which you know, it, really, it really creates a mood. And uh, again, it's funny to read some of these uh, archival notes about these, uh, the work of astrologers. The historian Monica Azzolini tells how the prince Galeazzo Maria Sforza actually asked for three different annual prognostications. And he said, don't let any of them know that I'm getting a second and third opinion. And I think he wanted to kind of choose the one that, <laughs> that worked best for him. Interestingly, one of his astrologers hit it right on the nose and predicted uh, Sforza's assassination uh, in 1476. The uh, people of the Renaissance were really interested in these kinds of uh, astrologically auspicious dates and times. Um, one common way that you would see that was through parallels between zodiac signs of prominent people. So this is a um, this is a medal of the first Roman emperor Augustus, and you can see that it has on one side this profile portrait, and then on the other side the sign of Capricorn, showing that he was born under Capricorn. So this is uh, you know right around 12 BC, I think. And here, 1,500 years later, we have Cosimo de' Medici from Florence striking a very, very similar medal with the profile portrait, showing himself in ancient armor like a Roman emperor, and also showing that he was born under Capricorn. I mean, it's, it would be hard to make a clearer kind of parallel between you know, the emperor and himself and the kind of ambition that Cosimo de' Medici had. And another kind of zodiac image that was very common in the Renaissance was the so-called zodiac man. This is a very beautiful one from the Très Riche Ur de, uh, de Duc de Berry. That is a intact uh, illuminated manuscript from the Renaissance. And you see the relationship between your star sign and various kinds of bodily maladies there, from your lungs to your genitals to your joints, uh, how the how celestial bodies could and your birth could influence uh, your bodily experience. So many practical kinds of things were determined uh, by the movements of the moon, the sun, and the stars. Navigation and geography would be two big ones, and even uh, the liturgical calendar, so the religious holidays that you would uh, celebrate. So for example, Easter, the Christian celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ two days after his crucifixion, um, is fixed on the calendar by a lunar calculation. Um, this is also true of Passover uh, for the Jewish faith. So in the Gregorian calendar, and take notes, uh, which the Roman Catholic Church used, so here's a lunar calendar of 2017. So Easter is on the first Sunday 
after the first full moon on or after the spring equinox, the vernal equinox. So this year, what this means, so the vernal equinox was on March 20th, but the first full moon was not until Tuesday, April 11th. So that meant that Easter was not until Sunday, April 16th. Do you see what I mean? So you're waiting for that first full moon, and then you can have uh, Easter on that next Sunday. So some of you might remember that Easter was quite late last year if you're of the Christian faith. So let's see if we can if we can figure this out. So if I show you a lunar calendar for next year, if you're thinking the vernal equinox is again on March 20th, you're looking for the first full moon after that date. So when is Easter next year? Sunday, April 1st. Sunday, April 1st. That's right. Easter Sunday will be Sunday, April 1st. So, uh, so yeah, you're able to figure that out now. Um, this is not just a party trick. Um, it's not why I'm, <laughs> I'm teaching you this. But rather, uh, Renaissance artists made reference to this lunar event in depictions of the, uh, of the crucifixion. So, for example, Jan van Eyck and workshop here, uh, he shows the crucifixion happening with this waning moon low in the sky, visible during the day, and correct uh, in its relationship to the vernal equinox, uh, if you see what I mean here. So he's really, he's injecting a kind of naturalism um, and realism into this religious scene uh, from which he was chronologically very, very distant. And if you look in the background here, it's a little hard to see, but this is supposed to be Jerusalem. The architecture is very um, European. It looks closer to Jan van Eyck's own world. Um, but these things that might seem like background details are actually very powerful here. They're saying that uh, this happened in our world. This is uh, this is continuing to be relevant to us today. Uh, these kinds of things f uh, work as kind of temporal and geographic expanders. So this correctly placed moon adds this powerful sense of uh, witnessing the event, of being witness to this sacred event. So uh, when I think of painters bringing the divine uh, back to earth, naturalism, I always think of Giotto. And Giotto, though he was very early, he is considered often one of the first Renaissance artists. Um, his angels don't float or flutter, you can see there, um, like painters of just a generation before, like Duccio, as we're seeing here, you see how they don't have any relationship, they're just floating in space there. Giotto's angels stand in their places, their halos overlap. It's all done in a very rational kind of scheme. Um, so, and the, this, he's very interested in three-dimensional space. The throne of the Madonna here is one that you could actually reconstruct. But you'll notice that he uses a gold background that's showing that this is a kind of heavenly space. This is not an earthly one. And Giotto's Arena Chapel in Padua, uh, painted in the first decade of the 14th century, features uh, several notable celestial scenes that also point to some of the problems that we might encounter when thinking about uh, the Renaissance and the visual celestial world. So when you look inside this chapel, you'll get an overwhelming sense of blue, uh, not just the ceiling, but the background color of these three tiers of scenes. These are scenes from the life of Mary and of Jesus Christ. And again, that blue, not gold, like we just saw, um, was something that was conceivably, you know, this could happen under the same sky. This was not very common at the time to show all of this blue in the background. But there are other ways that he brought these scenes back to earth. And the first is this remarkable scene of the adoration of the Magi. So in Christian tradition, the three Magi or three kings uh, had followed a star that led them to Bethlehem and the rustic place of Jesus Christ's birth. And this was interpreted variously by um, scholars and commentators who followed. I read one astronomer who said that this could be a very rare triple conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, which would leave a bright 
trail in the sky. But here Giotto interprets the star in another popular mode. The star of Bethlehem is transformed into a comet. And you can see the tail of the comet here. And I'm gonna show you my really, really bad keynote skills because I tried to make, <laughs> I tried to make, oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so this is not just any comet or any bad keynote keynoting here. Um, it's a specific comet, it's Halley's Comet, which Giotto himself had just witnessed in the year 1301. He'd witnessed it over Florence. And that's a significant adaptation for a number of reasons. Um, first, the Magi themselves who came to visit Jesus were Babylonian astronomers. So they studied and interpreted the stars. They would have understood that this was something out of the ordinary and interpreted it as uh, an omen. So it's kind of doing honor to their place or kind of specifying what their role was here. Um, and comets, which were relatively common, they were more common than a triple conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, um, were usually understood as negative omens of some war or disease. Disaster literally translates to you know, bad star. Um, centuries earlier, the artisans of the Bayou embroidery uh, <coughs> had shown people looking with wonder at Halley's Comet flying over England. So they were looking, they were looking, or they were looking with wonder at the star. They're looking up, there it is with its distinctive tail. But poor Harold here who um, has wrongly accepted the crown, he sees this as a portent of doom, and indeed his, his doom is sealed. So with Giotto, uh, the comet, um, not uniquely, but you know, fairly unusually, gets to be this kind of wondrous, strange, and uh, positive sign. And Giotto's adaptation did not go unnoticed over history. Um, in fact, just in the 1980s, the European Space Agency built a spacecraft made to study and travel close to Halley's Comet. And to me, very poignantly, they named it Giotto. It was called Giotto. And Giotto, the spacecraft, um, got closer to Halley's Comet than ever before. And this is just a remark, this is one of my favorite images. This is a stamp from Hungary that shows uh, Giotto the spacecraft uh, superimposed over Giotto's adoration of the shepherds. So yeah, I couldn't get a better image of that, but I really, it has, it still has the, the tag, whatever that's called. But if anyone finds a good image, then send it to me. Um, so one place in the arena chapel where Giotto cannot draw from his personal experience is in uh, the Last Judgment on the entrance wall of the chapel. So this is the scene where God returns uh, to judge the saved and the damned. And this is the end of human time and space. And this is one of my favorite details in the chapel. So this is up here. Uh, there are two military angels that are just rolling up Space time there. And you can see they're almost using it like, you know, it's a kind of stage curtain or something. And there, we get just this little tantalizing glimpse into the world beyond. So that blue that we associate with Giotto and with this chapel uh, gives way into this geometric, kind of gold leafed realm of glory. And this is done in relief. There's plaster that's built up into these diamonds here. So in a few feet from the Adoration of the Magi to the Last Judgment, we've gone from what could conceivably be a night sky over Florence into this world beyond our human understanding. And there's some pretty interesting ways that artists try to negotiate this in the Renaissance, this idea of this heavenly realm. Um, this is Fra Angelico's San Marco altarpiece. And this is what's called a um, sacred conversation or sacra conversazione. And so it has Mary and saints and contemporary figures who lived at different times. So this is not a realistic scene that could actually happen. This is a kind of heavenly 
conversation. And in order to indicate that this is not real space, uh, Fra Angelico uses a blue sky, but then he makes clouds of gold leaf. So you have that kind of, again, interesting interplay of the naturalistic and the supernatural. And another one of my favorites, and I did a really goofy keynote thing here as well, um, <laughs> is Fra Filippo Lippi's Coronation of the Virgin that uses these interesting slashes of blue and uh, darker blue. And again, it's to show us this is not a scene you could see looking through a window. This is not our own world, and that is not a night sky outside. So finally, let's look at this up to the ceiling of the Arena Chapel and what's called the Stellar Vault or the Starry Vault. So it's blue, as you can see, again, blue we love, uh, with metallic stars at regular intervals. So this was incredibly common from the medieval period forward. Um, sometimes they got very fancy with very fancy, complicated vaulting with metallic stars. Um, this is called the Church of Spavish Gmund in Germany. And sometimes they were relatively simple, like the smooth barrel vault of the Arena Chapel. Um, even the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, before Michelangelo uh, frescoed it in the, in the 16th century, had a stellar vault. So this is a reconstruction of that starry vault that it had. And there we are, post Michelangelo's intervention there. Um, so it's tempting to look up at a stellar vault and think of it as a depiction of the night sky. But really, it's anything but. Um, the stellar vault is supposed to evoke heaven. It is an iconic representation um, and a conventional portrayal meant to show the glory of God. And again, this shows a realm beyond human understanding and has more in common with the gold backgrounds that we saw with the Madonna and Child earlier than it does with the celestial maps that we saw right at the beginning. So the reason I mention this distinction is that, again, I think we, we get into kind of tricky territory here um, about what works uh, as a depiction of reality and what works as a symbol. And the celestial world, especially for Christianity, was used so often as a metaphor. Christ was the light of the world. Mary was the star of the sea. Um, light did a lot of really important uh, work in Christianity. And when you look up in a Christian church, whether you see a dome or a vault, you are supposed to think of a kind of perfection in geometry that reflects a greater uh, perfection of God's creation. So this was very influenced in the Renaissance by the Pantheon, which was um, a building with a perfectly uh, semi-spherical dome. And it was a circle inscribed within a square that really powerfully evokes the celestial world. It has these coffers, five rows of coffers that relate to the five planets that were known at the time, 28 coffers that refer to the number of days in a lunar month. So we would often hear the dome of a Christian church referred to as a dome of heaven, or adaptations called the dome of heaven. So I'll show you a dome that actually does depict a night sky for a different perspective. Um, this is the so-called astronomical dome in the apse of the old sacristy of San Lorenzo, which was the church of the Medici family, uh, like Cosimo de' Medici, who we saw earlier. This was a very wealthy banking family from Florence. And this is just an absolutely extraordinary dome uh, painted on the concave surface uh, of this smaller dome, about four meters in diameter, and so detailed that you could determine the specific date that it's supposed to depict. The bands of the zodiac are marked off here. And if we look up at it, if we look at some details, you can see that it's painted on a blue ground with highlights of uh, lead white and vine black, and then it has a, a gold leaf on top for the stars. So mostly what is shown are constellations that correspond to the zodiac, like Leo here. Uh, and some are just constellations that would have appeared in the sky on the date, like Cassiopeia here. 
And there's some scholarly debate about this, but it appears that the exact time and date, which you would see standing on the other side of this marble tabernacle here, where the ecliptic band of the zodiac is framed by the dome, uh, is July 6th, 1439 at noon. And this time and date would be the closing ceremony of the Council of Florence, which the Medici had funded. Remember, this is their church, and uh, which created a union between the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. So it was a really big deal. And the words read at the time of this, uh, the papal bull that ratified this union were, uh, let the heavens rejoice. So uh, beyond its beauty, this is, this is a very Renaissance monument to me. Um, this astronomical dome would have taken a huge talent to design, someone educated not only in perspective and mathematics, but painting, astronomy, astrology. And some people have suggested that it may have been Leon Battista Alberti, who um, wrote uh, the most important Renaissance treatises on painting and architecture. Uh, but I like one of their uh, one of the pieces of evidence that this scholar used is that there's this resemblance between his self-portrait medal and the figure of Orion here with the three stars on his belt. So something to think about. So now that we've seen comets and constellations and moons, uh, let's look at actual depictions of and references to eclipses. Uh, again, these mostly show up in Christian contexts. And so I should mention that the two major events of Christ's earthly life happened in darkness. Um, his birth happened in the middle of the night with the three magi following the star in order to find him. And at his death, according to three gospels, a great darkness spread over the earth. So this presents a real challenge to the artist. Night scenes are traditionally very, very difficult to paint. And in the Renaissance, uh, because of this difficulty and kind of um, wanting, to, uh, wanting to best each other, there was a, a kind of mini genre of the night nativity, showing the, the nativity happening at night, like Albert Outdorfer's here, and one of my favorites, uh, Herkton Tolz Jans. And you can see there's this little fire that the shepherds have set up here. But really what we're seeing is this supernatural light of Christ that he's providing. Um, the other event that happens in darkness is uh, the crucifixion, uh, which brings me to this image and a big fight that I had with my uncle over email. Uh, <laughs> So my uncle is a professor of theology, and he has literally written a book or several books on Christian art. And I made the mistake of saying that this tapestry, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, has a night sky, a quote, night sky backdrop. And he said, that's not true at all. This is not happening against a night sky. This is, again, this is more like the stellar vault that we saw before with these very regular stars. There are lots of things in uh, the Middle Ages that would be behind a crucifixion. There are fleur-de-lis here. There's a checkerboard background. Um, and he said, the only way the sun and moon would be obscured and the stars were visible, like we see here, would be during a solar eclipse. Aha! <laughs> Aha! So this led me to wonder if uh, any artist had uh, specifically shown the crucifixion is happening during a solar eclipse. Uh, again, the Bible doesn't say anything. They don't use the word eclipse. They talk about a darkness or an obfuscation. So they don't talk about a solar eclipse. And scholars decidedly said no. So this is probably the most famous commentator on uh, the, live, the Bible, the lives of saints, um, who says that there was this darkness over the whole earth, um, but it was not, quote unquote, a natural eclipse. Eclipses don't last for three hours. Eclipses don't take away light from that big of a territory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there were artists who did show uh, the 
crucifixion is happening during a solar eclipse, again, because of their own personal anecdotal experience. So Matthias Grunewald was a German artist who witnessed a solar eclipse in 1502, and it seems to have forever changed him. Um, his small crucifixion, this is the only painting by Grunewald in the U.S., it's in the National Gallery in D.C., um, shows the death of Christ against the backdrop of a true total solar eclipse. So you can see that the sun is obscured here. It's a little hard to see, but you can also see the stars, which you should be able to see during totality tomorrow. Um, and again, this is not described in the New Testament. There's no talking about a solar eclipse. It was simply that the sky became dark. And some translations even said uh, the sun and moon and stars became dark. So he's really making a choice. He's interpreting here. And you can see that he's not just interested in the eclipse, but in the mood that it creates on Earth. So it has this very eerie kind of uh, evergreen background, and then these iridescent half tones that you don't normally see in, uh, in a crucifixion painting, this mauve and lavender. Here is, uh, this is a much later painting, but it again shows this kind of brownish, starry sky. You see neither sun nor moon here, but again, it seems like uh, he might be indicating that there was a solar eclipse here. Uh, and Grunewald, I'll just say uh, one more thing. He he got a um, big commission for the Isenheim altar. This was for people who were suffering from, uh, for a hospital where people were suffering from this really awful ailment called St. Anthony's Fire. And he does these very, very dramatic paintings for this altar, uh, including this one of the resurrection. And... Uh, here you see that this is Christ triumphant over death. He's burst out of his tomb and he's dissolving into this kind of shimmering halo uh, of light, unlike, so unlike anything that we've really seen in the 15th century before. And Northern Renaissance art like this, it, it often gets a bad rap as being very, very literal. And Northern Renaissance artists can't think outside the world of, you know, mousetraps and dishpans and straw bales and you know, <laughs> reality. But here is this real image of transcendence, this beautiful image of transcendence that, again, I think is very much influenced by Grunewald's own experience of the eclipse. Uh, one of the sexiest images of an eclipse that I found from the Renaissance is this by Raphael, uh, Rebecca and Isaac, spied on by Abimelech. And this is uh, from the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, where Isaac, the son of Abraham, and his wife Rebecca are fleeing a famine in Israel, and they're taken in by the Philistines. And uh, Isaac is worried. He's wealthy, and he has this beautiful wife. And he decides that he's going to say that Rebecca is his sister rather than his wife. Um, he's afraid that he'll get killed and replaced. But he is caught uh, by Abimelech in this moment, the king, uh, by the king of the Philistines, embracing or caressing his wife, which causes some consternation. So Genesis says, quote, when Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebecca. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, isn't that your sister? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> he said, uh, he said, she, she's really your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? So Isaac has to explain himself. Um, and this is the point is that Abimelech is deceived, and this is part of a number of kind of strange wife-sister narratives in Genesis. But the artist Raphael chose this subject, not super often portrayed, uh, as part of a huge commission for the Vatican Palace, the Pope's Palace in Rome, uh, that is sometimes called the Raphael Bible. And he would have been working with a big workshop but even if Raphael didn't paint this himself, he certainly planned it carefully, probably in consultation with Vatican astronomers. So the first thing I notice about this painting is the posture 
of Rebecca and Isaac here, with Rebecca's knee thrown over Isaac's. So in the Renaissance, this would be a well-known visual shorthand for a sexual tryst. Um, you would see nymphs and gods uh, in similar attitudes, always with strong sensual overtones. And the voyeurism of Abimelech kind of heightens this erotic charge. And then, of course, there's the fact that this is happening under that eerie brownish light of a total solar eclipse. Raphael had never seen a total solar eclipse, but he had just witnessed an annular one. And you can see that the sun is totally obscured with just these little coronal rays escaping, um, selectively illuminating this scene of a stolen embrace. So the eclipse, again, it's not in the text at all. It's not in Genesis. There's no, uh, you know, they just say that he looked out his window and saw these two caressing. So it's a choice by the artist here that highlights that transient moment and the urgency of their desire for one another. Uh, they were willing to risk just the fleeting moments of totality and the darkness that an eclipse would provide. And uh, this is part of a suite of images. So you can see it down here. This is on a ceiling in a vault. There's a whole uh, more complicated scene where it looks like you're looking out into the sky. But this one scene became very popular and it gets uh, singled out and reproduced a lot. Here it is even on a plate. Um, for <laughs> so, um, and I'll also quickly mention... Um, the painting with the great title, Dionysus, the Areopagite Converts the Philosophers by the French painter Antoine Caron. Um, this was painted at the court of Catherine de' Medici, the Queen of France. And uh, even though superficially it might not look like a religious scene, this is a scene of religious conversion. So um, Dionysus himself was a recent convert to Christianity, and he's using this moment of the solar eclipse to convert these pagan Greek philosophers and astronomers. So even though they have a lot of knowledge of the uh, celestial world, they still need that religious faith. So I'll leave you with the paintings of Tadeo Gaddi, a painter who was himself blinded by looking at a partial eclipse in the year 1304. Uh, and he wrote to a friend, he said, for days not long past, I have suffered and still suffer from an unendurable infirmity of the eyes, which has been occasioned by my own folly, unquote. And though he never depicted an eclipse per se, Gaudi continually returned to images of blinding supernatural light, like here uh, in the vision of the Franciscans, and then here in the, uh, in the Annunciation to the Shepherds. So it's like he's continually acting out that fateful moment where he lost part of his sight. Um, it's very, very poignant. His whole career acts as a kind of warning to wear your eclipse glasses. <laughs> they did not have the ISO 13212 uh, stamp. So I hope that this selection of images makes you feel really good about your decision to be in Columbia, South Carolina for this solar eclipse. Uh, you can see how the eclipse and other celestial events could be an intensely personal affair for artists and could evoke anything from doom to wonder and many points in between. And I thought a lot looking, about these, looking at these images, how the eclipse creates a, a mood. It changes everything on earth as well as in the sky. So it's a good reminder to take in everything that happens around us tomorrow the smells, the sounds, the atmosphere and light, uh, and not just looking up to the heavens. So thank you, happy eclipse, and do keep looking up.